Good evening, and welcome to Masterminds 2022. My name is John Anderson. I'm a member of the University of Victoria Retirees Association. To begin, on behalf of Masterminds and this evening's presenter, I would like to acknowledge the Lekwungen speaking peoples on whose unceded territory the University of Victoria stands and the uh, Xanich, uh, Esquimalt, and Songhees people uh, with whom we share this wonderful uh, space on Earth. Uh, the Mastermind series is a collaborative initiative of the uh, U UVic Retirees Association and the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health. Uh, it's intended to foster university community engagement uh, by providing high quality lectures on uh, significant topics um, by university re Victoria retirees. The series is over 15 years old. Uh, it has presented well over 60 uh, lectures during this time. And this evening's presentation will uh, be another excellent, incisive, and very interesting uh, presentation. The Mastermind series is comprised of four presentations uh, on each Wednesday evening in April. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, the lecture is created and delivered by a UVic retiree uh, in a topic of their choosing in their field of expertise and of general interest. Uh, before going any further, I'd like to recognize Leah Potter from the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health, who uh, basically manages the, uh, the presentation. She is uh, uh, in the background, so to speak, but in control. Uh, before we begin the presentation this evening, just a few words on the Zoom format. Um, as members of the audience, uh, your audio is going to be muted um, and the session is going to be recorded. And um, it, it will be uh, uploaded onto uh, YouTube and available also on the websites of the Retirees Association and the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health. Uh, in addition, there will be a question period at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can submit uh, questions at any time during the presentation uh, by simply going to uh, the bottom of your screen, uh, your Zoom screen, and just uh, to the right of center, there's a little tab uh, Q&A. If you just tap on that, uh, you'll be able to enter the text of your uh, question, which will be uh, uh, responded to uh, at the conclusion of the presentation. And now on to the presentation and this evening's presenter, Hugh Cartwright. Uh, he's a member of the UVic chemistry department in the 70s and 80s before joining the chemistry faculty at the University of Oxford. Uh, his research is focused on the uh, uh, applications of an artificial intelligence, particularly, particularly, sorry, in the solution of scientific problems. Uh, these studies have included the use of genetic algorithms, artificial neural networks, Cajonan networks, data mining techniques, and fermerone trial algorithms to problems such as dispersal of airborne pollution, optimization of organic synthetic routes, industrial process control, drug design, reverse engineering of archeological discoveries, uh, amongst many other topics, quite, quite a eclectic collection of problems. He has published extensively in these areas. Um, currently he's a member of an OECD committee whose aim is to assess the use of artificial intelligence in science. Uh, and he also informs me that uh, for almost 30 years, he ran the Oxford University Chemistry Open Days, uh, which means they were quite successful. And he claims uh, the success of the shows in Oxford is owed much to the experience he gained as a sidekick to Dr. Zonk, also known as the late great Reg Mitchell here at UVic. Now, artificial intelligence, the topic of this evening's pr presentation, is now widespread in industry and the media. Uh, their users are often unaware of it being employed. Uh, and there are many reasons why we should be a little bit more attentive. Firstly, with this tool, we can solve some types of problems more quickly and more accurately than ever before. Secondly, 
its growth from obscurity to widespread use in a little more than a decade is simply fascinating to follow. And finally, because the field is still so young, artificial intelligence continues to surprise users as well as scientists with what it can achieve. This evening's non-technical talk will outline how AI, artificial intelligence, uh, what, uh, why an understanding of what lies behind AI decision-making is crucial. It will also discuss whether the development of AI could be a step towards conscious machines. So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hugh Cartwright. Thank you very much, John, and good evening, everyone. Um, as John said, I want to talk about three topics tonight. Um, firstly, what do we mean by artificial intelligence? Secondly, should we be expecting it to give us explanations? And finally, the question of whether machines might become conscious. If you went into a computer lab maybe 20 years ago, you would have Almost certainly, if you found there was somebody working on AI there, artificial intelligence, you would almost certainly have been in a university lab or you would have been in the lab of a large corporation like IBM, for example. The situation has changed very rapidly and artificial intelligence is used by a great range of organizations now. It's used by governments, it's used by Facebook, and Google, it's used in autonomous cars, it's used in computer games. And what this tells us is that artificial intelligence works because there's no way that Tesla would be using artificial intelligence um, if it simply was adding nothing to their cars. So let's start with a definition of artificial intelligence. This is a definition that the computer scientists wouldn't like very much but I actually think it's a rather good definition. Artificial intelligence or AI is a computer program that learns. Now, one of the reasons that I think this is a nice definition is that it encapsulates, first of all, the fact that AI programs do learn, they must learn. And secondly, it provides a contrast with the kinds of programs that normally we would use on a computer. So if you've got a computer at home, um, you might use a spreadsheet on that. And as soon as you start the spreadsheet, it knows everything that it needs to know. You don't need to teach it that two times three is, is six. And the same thing is true of an email program. As soon as you start your email program, it knows what to do. It doesn't need to spend a long time, weeks and months perhaps, learning how to retrieve emails for you and where to send them. By contrast, AI programs learn. Um, now, that is potentially a problem. And the reason it's potentially a problem is that learning requires training and training requires time. So we can look at how long it takes a computer program, an AI program to learn. And if it's learning a simple problem, that learning might take a second or so. If it's learning a complex problem, it may be that the learning time required is weeks or even months. And what that tells us is that there must be some big advantage in having a program that can learn. Otherwise, there's no point in having a program that is sitting around doing nothing other than learning uh, for maybe many months before it can be useful to you. In the, the next few minutes, I will give you a hint or some hints as to what the advantages are of having a computer program that can learn. Let's start our investigation with a thought experiment. Um, 
the good news is that you have won the lottery and you've always wanted a car, you've always wanted an electric car, so you go out and you buy yourself a Tesla, knowing the Teslas have um, AI built into them. You are keen to try this out, so you jump into the passenger seat and you tell the Tesla, take me for a drive around Victoria. And off you go, um, you go around a corner, and all of a sudden, this is what you see. Fortunately, your Tesla, avoid an accident and in your thought experiment no elephants are harmed but you're intrigued as well as relieved by this you're intrigued because you have discovered that ai programs learn and yet it's hard to see how your tesla could possibly have learned about elephants there are for those of you who don't live anywhere near victoria there are no wild ele elephants anywhere near victoria and you're confident, I'm sure, that there are no elephants in Tesla factories. So how did the AI know what to do? You have a theory, and your theory is that hidden in the AI, there are rules. So you think that the AI contains a whole set of rules. Um, here's an example of one of those rules. If you see huge gray things with tusks and a trunk, stop right away. You think that your AI is just packed with rules like that. And as the Tesla drives along, it is constantly going through these rules to understand what it needs to do. So you go home, you look on the internet, and you discover on the internet that you can plug your PC into the Tesla and see what's inside the Tesla. So you do that, and what you find inside your AI is this. There isn't a single rule in sight inside the ai you have numbers and nothing else this is what the inside of all ais look like well where did those numbers come from what do they mean let's look at how an ai learns and this is going to be the only sort of slightly technical slide um, in the whole presentation and so if you get bored don't worry it's soon going to disappear it is possible for you to get an AI that you can run on your home computer. So let's suppose that you've gone out, you bought yourself an AI and managed to install it on your computer. And you are now going to get your computer, your AI, to learn something. There are many things that you might get it to learn. Let's suppose you're going to get it to learn how to identify cattle. In order to do that, you need to show it many, many examples of cows with labels attached so that it begins to get a feel for what a particular type of cow looks like. What we're seeing here is the inside of our AI, a very small portion of it, before the learning has started. And if you've just unboxed your AI and put it onto your PC, then all of these numbers in the AI's memory mean absolutely nothing at all. Your AI knows nothing, it has no knowledge at all. And so when you look at the memory inside your AI, although it's got numbers in it, those numbers are meaningless. So now what we need to do is to train it. So we find a picture of a cow, there we are, and it's in this instance, a Highland cow. So we show this picture of the cow to the AI, and we say, this is what we understand to be a Highland cow. And it takes the numbers that were in its memory and it adjusts those numbers by a small amount. You can see the 4.69 has turned into 4.68, the minus 0.97 has turned into minus one and so on. And this adjustment is leaving a kind of very faint impression of what a Highland cow looks like in the memory. So the memory started off with complete rubbish in it and now we have changed it but only very slightly to in some way encode what a Highland cow looks like. Now, this all sounds pretty mysterious, I know, um, but it's not actually mysterious in fact. There are comparatively straightforward mathematical steps that we use that allow us to go from this picture here to putting some information about the picture into the AI's memory. But we want our AI to be able to recognize many cows. So we show it another one. And this one that I'm afraid is half hidden behind John and Leah. Um, this is a Frisian. 
And when we show it the Frisian, again, the AI says, OK, now I need to update my memory. So it makes more minor changes to its memory. So these numbers gradually change. We'll show it another cow and it turns out to be another highland. And again, we update this memory here. So we're making very small changes to this memory. And each time we do that, the memory gets a slightly better understanding of what a particular kind of cow looks like. So here is an Oreo cow. Uh, you'll understand why that has that name. And we just keep on this process for many, many iterations. And each cow that appears allows the AI to get a slightly better picture of what that type of cow uh, really is like. There are several important things to understand about this process. The first is that it's a slow process. We've got to show many, many pictures because this picture of a Highland cow looks a bit different from this one here. There are two cows here. The AI has no idea what two means. So it needs to see many pictures so that it can eventually sort of encapsulate the essence of a Highland cow. And it needs to see many pictures of Oreos, many pictures of Frisians. And by many, I mean probably thousands of pictures, possibly tens of thousands of pictures. So we show it picture after picture and gradually it gets an idea of what these, cat, these cows look like. The second thing to notice is that we don't have a separate area in the memory of the AI in which a particular type of cow is stored. So if we could, could look at the memory of our trained AI after it's gone through this process of seeing all these pictures, we wouldn't find that in the, the top right hand corner of it, there was information about Oreos. And in the bottom left hand corner, there was, picture, there was uh, information about Highland cattle. The information, confusingly, is spread all over the memory for all, all of the cows. Um, this, this sounds a, a strange thing to do, but that's just the way that the mathematics works out. Thirdly, we have no pictures actually stored in the memory. In other words, what is not happening is the AI is not learning by saying, ah, oh, this is a picture of an Oreo. I will store this exact picture somewhere in the memory so that I can come back and look at it later. So there are no pictures stored in the memory. And finally, and this is quite a subtle point that I will come back to, the AI knows nothing about what a cow is like. Um, if you showed these pictures to a four-year-old girl and you said, OK, I'll show you some pictures, and then in two minutes I'll ask you to tell me about a Highland cow, the description that she would give you of the Highland cow would be, well, it's a thing that's got big, long, pointy horns and is sort of brown and shaggy. But the AI knows nothing like that. All it does is to take the image that it sees in front of it and analyzes it. And there's a curious consequence of that. If we showed only pictures of Oreo cows on a sunny day with a blue background to the AI, and if we showed only pictures of Highland cattle from Scotland, where you'll know it rains 24 hours a day, then the AI would eventually learn that Oreos and blue sky are associated with each other, and Highland cattle and rain are associated with each other. And the consequence would be that if you showed it an Oreo cow in the rain, the AI might get confused. So what that tells us is that we need to make sure that we show a representative sample of all of these types of cows, some in the sunshine, some in the, the rain, and so on. Okay, now this is beginning to sound quite complex. I said that there was one technical slide and, and this is, and you probably have turned off at, at this stage. Um, but do AIs actually work after we've gone through this training process? Well, the answer is that they don't actually work terribly well under some conditions. For example, um, this slide here you'll see again right at the end of the presentation, and I will at that point explain what the connection is between these images. There is a connection between these images. But if we tried to train an AI so that it knew about beer, and then subsequently it knew about hockey, once we started to try to train it 
with some facts about hockey, it would gradually forget about beer. And if we tried to say, okay, let's teach it a bit of law, it would forget about hockey. In other words, AI at the moment is very poor at dealing with different types of information. Recognizing cows, that's fine. Making odd connections, that is not so fine. In fact, it's not even very good sometimes at recognizing something. Um, a, there's a, a famous example on the web where somebody trained an AI to recognize chihuahuas. And after, uh, after it was correctly trained, it then was given a whole, um, uh, the freedom of the web, if you like, to go out and find pictures of chihuahuas. Um, and this is what it found. And you can see that it's actually rather good at recognizing chihuahuas, but it's also rather good at recognizing blueberry muffins. So the AI is not doing a terribly good job. And in a way, you ought to be concerned by this because we've got at least three difficulties. First of all, the AIs seem to take a long time to train, if, especially if we're training them to recognize something like an image. Secondly, the AIs are very difficult to understand because they're just full of numbers. And thirdly, judging by its success or failure with the chihuahuas, it, they're not even very good. So having, um, I hope, presented a rather negative picture of what AIs might do, let me present a couple of real examples which I hope will um, convince you that AIs do have some advantages. This is the, the first of these two examples, and it shows how we could use AIs in medicine. On the left-hand side, this is an ECG, an electrocardiogram, taken of a patient in the emergency ward of a hospital. And on the right-hand side, I recognize that this is very difficult to, to see, um, but you don't really need to see the details. We have six pairs of traces from a delivery ward. And the top trace is showing you the fetal heart rate of the child in the womb. And underneath it, you're seeing the contractions of the mother during delivery. So there's one patient here, a second patient there, and so on. Now, these traces, both the ECG and the traces from the delivery room, have a number of features in common. Firstly, they are of central importance. Um, I'm not a proper doctor, and perhaps you are not a proper doctor either, but you can see looking at this trace, this ECG, which is telling you, which is showing the electrical signals in and around the heart, you can see that the behavior of the heart is very unstable. So this is a patient who might well need immediate attention. Equally, it may be that one or more of the women undergoing labor, um, the traces are going to say, this is a person who really ought to be um, penciled in for an immediate cesarean. The second thing, apart from the significance of these traces, is that they're very complex. An ECG doesn't just say, OK, this is the way the heart is beating. It tells you a great deal about the state of the valves, whether there's damage in the heart, quite possibly also information about the state of the person as well, the, the, the sort of general health of the person. So there's lots of information there. Thirdly, the information is transient. So if you're a doctor and you see this ECG in front of you, you've either got it on a piece of paper and the piece of paper um, is going to sit on your lap and you may miss what's appearing on the computer monitor over the patient, or you might have stopped the trace that is appearing on that monitor in order to look at it. And you might then be missing something, missing some important change in the signal as it comes through. So we can use an AI to monitor a trace like this. It's quite difficult to set up an AI that analyzes moving data of this sort, but it can be done. And there are good reasons why we might want to do that. Firstly, it's possible that we have a technician who is available, who has taken the ECG, but there isn't a doctor available at the time to analyze it, and the technician may not have the skills to do that. But here, as I say, is an ECG indicating that possibly um, immediate treatment is required. Secondly, 
the trace may show the kind of subtle effects that I mentioned with the cows. Remember with the cows, um, we were not interested in the fact that there might be a blue background or there might be some rain occurring, but the AI would notice that. And it could be that people who show, um, have some particular diagnosis, have um, some indication of perhaps a very rare condition in the ECGs. The AI, when it is learning how to analyze an ECG like this, will look at everything in the pattern, everything that's there. And it may pick out small features that a doctor, even an experienced doctor, might not recognize. So there the AI is acting as an assistant, if you like, to the doctor, being able to pick out things which the doctor might be unaware of. A second example of an AI um, is one from science, my own field. Um, this is a picture of something called the Large Hadron Collider, LHC. The Large Hadron Collider is the biggest and most expensive piece of scientific equipment there is in the whole world. It lives in a tunnel, a donut shaped tunnel, of which you can see a portion here. And that donut shaped tunnel is buried under the ground at CERN, which is near Geneva in Switzerland. And what the LHC does is to take a very low concentration of atoms and feed them through a couple of little pipes. And the little pipes go round inside this donut, which is 27 kilometers in circumference so it would take you about four hours to walk all the way around it and the atoms are passed in opposite directions in two beams through these pipes you can just see the little pipes just there and there so the pipes themselves are very small the beams of atoms go in opposite directions and when they are traveling very very rapidly the beams are brought together and they collide and you get a sort of tiny explosion. So this is a little explosion that's taken place in the center here when a couple of atoms have hit each other and the atoms fragment because the energy involved is so very large. And what you're seeing here are the tracks of all the particles that are created in one little explosion, in one collision between a pair of atoms. Physicists love this because this tells them about the structure of matter. But there's a big problem. And the problem is that data are produced by the LHC at an absolutely prodigious rate. It takes about two seconds to generate enough data that would fill the hard disks of 10,000 PCs in the experiments that are run on the LHC. Now, CERN has some fantastic computers, but it cannot deal with data of that quantity. And so what happens is it feeds the data through an AI, the AI filters out the noise, which is about 99% of the data, and leaves behind signals which are sufficiently small that they can be accommodated. So we've got a couple of examples then of what seem to me to be useful applications. In fact, the um, Large Hadron Collider really without the AI, it would be almost impossible to analyze the data. So the AI there is pretty much essential. But there is a problem, another problem with AIs. And this is that AIs essentially function as sort of black boxes. So what we do is we feed in something like the image of a Highland cow, and it tells us that that was a Highland cow, but it doesn't tell us how that um, conclusion was reached. And if I have managed to convince you now that AIs can do something useful with the medical example and CERN, let me now sow some seeds of doubt. This is an interesting, I think a very interesting application. It's a, another real application and this was developed by a company called Sanas in California. They were addressing a problem that, that probably many of us have met at one time or another. If you call a call center, then you may be connected to somebody in the local area. So if you ring from Victoria, it's possible you'll reach a call center in Victoria, but you're just as likely to reach a call center in Johannesburg or in Buenos Aires or, or in Mumbai. 
And if you do reach a call center in some totally different country, you may find it difficult to understand the accent of the person that's responding to you. This is how Sanus's software works. Imagine that we have a caller in Texas. That caller rings up a call center. I've chosen Texas um, simply because the Texan accent is something that we probably all recognize and it's quite a strong accent. So the caller from Texas is connected to somebody in Montreal and the chap in Texas starts talking and his accent says, hello, I'm Texan. Those are not his words, but that's what his accent is saying. The lady in the call center in Montreal starts talking and her accent says, hello, I'm French or I'm French Canadian. But her words don't go straight back to Texas. What happens is that her words go into an artificial neural network, which is the most common type of AI. And the artificial neural network takes the words that the woman in Montreal is speaking and superimposes on them a Texan accent. And those words are then sent back to Texas. And so you see now that the conversation is between two people who are speaking Texan. There are a couple of things about this application that I think are quite remarkable. The first is that this process here, the translation from French Canadian accent to Texan accent, takes place in real time. The time delay as the processing is done is of the order of a tenth of a second. And so neither of these speakers are aware of any delay in the conversation. And the second remarkable thing is that the software for this was written entirely by Sanas's own software engineers in-house. And nobody in the company, including the software engineers and the chief executive officer, nobody in the company understands how it works. Now, that's not to say they don't understand the computer code that they've written. They've understood the, the software engineers understand how they have constructed this network. They just don't understand how it has done this transformation. Now, you might say, well, OK, it would be nice to know what's going on here, but it doesn't really matter if we don't understand it. We don't really need an explanation. But let me give you another example where now the explanation is crucial. You'll recall that. Um, in an earlier thought experiment, you won the lottery. The lottery made you rich and famous. And so the province that you're in has rewarded you by making you the Minister for Health in your province. Now, like all ministers, you don't know anything at all about what you're meant to be doing. And so the province has generously given you an AI to help. The role of this AI is to take resources like equipment and ambulances and doctors and so on and allocate them across the province to make sure that the health service is as efficient as possible. You go into your office one day and you discover that overnight the AI which is responsible for allocating these resources has picked up all your resources and taken them to a different part of the country. The AI has done this without leaving you a, a post-it note saying, this is what I'm gonna do. So you look at the demographics of the two areas concerned, and you find that the area in which, from which these materials were removed has a fairly uniform population. Um, they appear here as, as sort of balding Einsteins. And the area to which the resources were allocated now has a different looking population. They still look vaguely Einsteinish, but now they've got more hair. And so you say to your AI, what will you do? But AIs can't explain. And so it could be that if it was to explain, if it knew how to explain, it would say, oh, I'm sorry, that's a mistake. Or it could say oh, I'm biased or it could say I know what I'm doing, but I'm not going to let on what I'm what my reasoning is. Now, here, in contrast to the previous slide where we didn't know what the Sanus software was doing, but it didn't really matter. Here, not knowing the reasons behind what the software has done could be disastrous. Instead of this area here, the red area from which resources have been removed, instead of that being filled with Einstein, suppose it was filled with predominantly black people 
or predominantly indigenous people or people with a high prevalence of disabilities. And suppose that the green area was now full of white middle class Canadians. Then understanding why the AI had made this swap of resources would be absolutely crucial, not just in saving your political life, but in understanding what's going on in the provincial health service. So we seem to have a big problem here. And the big problem is we don't know how to get explanations. We don't know how to get explanations from AI for two reasons. One is, as I've suggested earlier, that the inside of an AI is full of numbers. It's not full of English sentences. It's not full of rules. Translating those numbers into meaningful English is very difficult. There's another reason why it's difficult to get explanations from AIs. And this was neatly encapsulated by a guy called George Dyson a few years ago, who wrote the following. Any AI that is simple enough to be understandable will not be complicated enough to behave intelligently. So we can understand simple AIs, but they're not gonna be much good. And conversely, any AI complicated enough to behave intelligently will be too complicated to understand. This is suggesting that we'll never understand AIs. Um, the reality is somewhat better than that, we shall do, but it is nevertheless very difficult to understand them. And I'd like to sort of drive home the point here by giving you a couple of examples where explanation is even more critical. The first one is going back to your car. You remember you had a Tesla, you take your Tesla out again after you've managed to avoid the elephants, and now all of a sudden you've struck a pedestrian. Who's to blame for that? It's not an easy question to answer. It could be the software designers, the people who sketched out what the software in the car was meant to do. It could be the software engineers who wrote that software. It could be people who tested the software. It might be the company that specified what the software is to do or built the car. It could be you because you were sitting in the passenger seat when maybe you should have been in the driving seat being able to take emergency action. It could be the pedestrian who shouldn't have stepped in front of you. But the AI is at the heart of all this. And if the AI can't explain its logic, then that makes assessing who should be blamed for this very difficult. I should just, just as a sort of quick diversion here, mention something um, that I've not seen discussed, but I think is potentially a serious issue as well. Um, it, it's nothing to do with explanation, as you'll see. Imagine that we are 20 years down the line. So we're sat perhaps at, at the beginning of the 2040s. Everybody's driving around in autonomous cars. And uh, let's suppose we're in Vancouver or we're in London, some, some large city. Uh, a pedestrian st steps out in front of an autonomous car. The car stops and the pedestrian then crosses the street. So the car starts moving again and another pedestrian steps out in front of it. The car stops and the pedestrian moves on. And this process is repeated again and again because all the pedestrians know that it's entirely safe to step out in front of an autonomous car. And so in places like London, where jaywalking is an art, the traffic is gonna to grind to a halt. Now, of course we can't have that. So how do we stop it? Well, we could put a policeman on every corner. And as soon as the policeman spots somebody stepping out of line when they shouldn't be crossing the street, they can book them. But there aren't enough policemen to go around. So what is plan B? Plan B is to put face detection cameras everywhere. And the face detection cameras will notice which pedestrians are stepping out into the street and send them a ticket. So curiously, the introduction of autonomous cars might eventually lead to an increase in the number of um, face recognition cameras in big cities, which is probably not something that we would like. One final example of why explanation is, is critical, and this is a particularly difficult one. Triage is the process of taking account of people's injuries when they're brought into emergency 
and assigning priority to them. Um, it's an extremely stressful thing to have to do because it involves people who are uh, perhaps badly injured um, and, and emergency resources have to be allocated on the fly. It's a good place, for, well, one might imagine it's a good place to, to use AI in, but the presence of AI in emergency would lead to some really tricky decisions. For example, suppose that AI assesses a patient or uh, a patient is assessed and AI is, is, has some input into this. Then the question comes up, can this patient be saved? In other words, is this patient so badly injured or so ill that they probably are going to die? And that's a practical question, a medical question. Should this patient be saved? This now is an ethical question. Suppose that the patient could be saved. They are ill, but they could be saved. But there are another half dozen patients in a similar situation. And only there are only sufficient doctors to be able to treat four or five of them. Should this patient be saved? Perhaps it's a young child with their whole life in front of them. Perhaps it's uh, the father or mother of a young family. Perhaps it's a, a famous artist or something like that. Should this patient be saved? And even worse, how should the decision about what is to be done with this patient be communicated to the patient and the relatives? And that's both ethical and practical. These are areas where we need to put in a lot of time and effort in order to get explanations that are going to be appropriate in those situations. Let's now look at the, the final topic I want to talk about, and that's the question of whether we are on a route which might take us to, machine, to machines that are conscious. Those of you who have seen the film The Imitation Game um, will know about the Turing test. Alan Turing was a Cambridge University mathematician who in the Second World War was seconded to go to Bletchley Park, which is, was a, um, um, a, a secret location in the south of England during the Second World War. And he was part of a team which was um, given the task of trying to break the Enigma code that the, um, the Germans were using during the Second World War. And he gave his name to something that's become known as the Turing test. This is how the Turing test works. Probably most of you know about it anyway, but I will describe it. This person here is sitting at a computer terminal, having a chat through the computer terminal with something on the other side of the wall. And the something on the other side of the wall could be a person who is just responding and chatting away. So these two are chatting to each other, or it could be that what is on the other side of the wall is a computer. And this person is chatting with a computer. If this person is unable when chatting to the computer, to recognize that it is a computer and not a person, then that computer has passed the Turing test. And the question that's raised is, if the test is passed by the computer, is the computer actually thinking in the sense that we think? And is it conscious? And how would we know? When I was about 12, I read a short story. This short story, I suspect, but I don't know, I suspect it was written by a guy called Ray Bradbury, who was an American science fiction writer. And in this story, there is the, the, the hero discovers that in the whole world, there are only about 50 real people. And all the other beings around him look exactly like humans and behave exactly like humans, but in fact are robots. And the story is a discussion of how he goes out on this search to see if he can find a real person. Detecting whether somebody is conscious is really tough. How would we know? Well, let's think about what makes us conscious. There are a couple of possibilities that we might think. One is that consciousness arises from the brain alone. So every aspect of consciousness is somehow explained, although we don't know how, by what's going on in the brain. Consciousness therefore begins at some stage, we don't know quite when, but it begins at some stage, sometime obviously after conception, perhaps there is some consciousness in the womb, 
maybe consciousness really begins to develop once the child is born and can start interacting with its surroundings. Or it could be that consciousness is not developed in the biology. There is just here, hidden away behind John, I'm afraid, I'm afraid um, there is plus X. So this is saying that consciousness is not a property of the brain. Consciousness is a property of something inanimate outside the brain. We could call it a, a soul or a spirit or something like that. But the key aspect is that this is something entirely inanimate. And that's where consciousness arises. There are some difficulties with this latter picture here. In particular, we can wonder how it could be that something inanimate can cause physical changes. For example, as you see, I've just raised my arm. I've made a conscious decision to raise my arm. If it is my soul or my spirit, this inanimate thing that is responsible for me raising my arm, somehow that X needs to communicate with my brain and change things in my brain so that nerves, nerve signals get sent down my body to my muscles. But if something is inanimate, if the soul is inanimate, it's very difficult to see how it can possibly influence the brain directly. It needs to make physical changes in the brain. But how does that happen? And by a similar argument, if this inanimate X is responsible for consciousness, why is it that if injury or a stroke damages the brain, why does that destroy consciousness? Because it's not damaging the X. Now, having raised those doubts, I have to say that it is possible. Uh, in fact, it's inevitable that there are things that science doesn't know. And it could well be that we all of us do have a soul of some sort uh, and that it interacts with the brain in ways that we have yet to discover. But I'm going to assume for the sake of argument that biology alone is determining consciousness. So how, if we wanted, and I'm not suggesting this is desirable, but how could we, if we wanted, build a conscious machine? One possibility would be to copy the brain. If you were watching David Doherty's talk last week, then you will have learnt a lot about the brain, much more than I'm going to say today. This is a, a very sort of schematic view of a portion of the brain. Each of the little dots here, of course, is a neuron. These are the processing units in the brain, and the neurons are joined to each other by these filaments. Each neuron may be joined to 10 or 50 or a couple of hundred separate neurons. So the brain is an immensely complicated arrangement. There are around about 80 to 100 billion neurons and more than a trillion connections. Maybe we could just, because we're very good at making things out of silicon, we make um, silicon computer chips, maybe we could just make a three-dimensional copy of this using silicon. This turns out to be, in essence, impossible. It's technologically impossible, not theoretically impossible. Computer chips are two-dimensional. If you look at computer chips, they seem to have a height, but in actual fact, the, the business part of a computer chip is basically flat. It is possible to make three-dimensional computer chips. This is a portion of an analog chip, and the pillars and lines across here that you see are metal connectors. So these metal connectors are joining a layer down here to a layer up here and to a layer up there. But there is no physical way in which we can join this neuron here to other neurons with hundreds of connections. You just can't do it. So building a three-dimensional computer chip, we the only way that we could possibly do that would be to reproduce this exactly. And our technology is way, way too simple to allow us to do that. Possibly it's something that could be done in 50 years, but uh, it's, it's as far off as that. So perhaps there are other ways. Uh, this is uh, your family tree, all right? It's, it's not entirely accurate, as you'll see, um, you or I are down the bottom here. What I want to do is to work backwards. So here's me, and I'm conscious. I, I'm pretty, pretty sure I'm conscious. 
And I'm certain that my mother and father were conscious as well. I didn't know my grandparents very well, but whenever I met them, I was pretty sure that they were conscious. Um, somewhere in the past, well, maybe there was Marie Antoinette. Um, she might have been a descendant from Shakespeare, though they must surely have been conscious to have done the kinds of things that they did. Um, Michelangelo, was he? I mean, I'm not even quite certain whether he was before or after Shakespeare, but uh, they might have been related. The Aztecs, well, they did some fantastic building and so did the Egyptians and the Babylonians. They must all have been conscious. The farming communities, four or five or 6,000, 10,000 years ago, um, they weren't as sophisticated as the Babylonians, but it's hard to imagine that farming could uh, take the level of sophistication that it did at that time without those people being conscious as well. And even further back, maybe 50,000 years ago, uh, there were probably some conscious people there. What's the point of all that? The point is the link to DNA. My DNA obviously is closely related to the DNA of my parents and pretty closely related to that of my grandparents. Um, I don't suppose I have a, a very strong link to Shakespeare, but you never know. As we go further and further back, the difference between my DNA and the DNA of all of these other peoples grows progressively greater. And yet, I've argued that all of these were conscious. All of these people were conscious, even though their DNA is different from mine. My DNA is partly responsible, in fact, really entirely responsible for designing my brain. So if my DNA designs my brain in a particular way, the DNA of people many thousands of years ago who were still conscious, their DNA was different and it follows that almost certainly their brains look different. This is a deeply, deeply unsettling conclusion. And it's unsettling for the following reason. Experiments have suggested that some animals with large brains are self-aware or show signs of being self-aware. And they include orcas around Victoria, they include other types of whales, they include elephants and some large apes. So there's a real possibility that some of those animals, maybe all of those animals are conscious in the same way that we are conscious. And, and here is a, um, a, a political point. Um, think back to what happens in the Southern Pacific when every year a large number of whales are killed in the name of research and the research in essence uh, involves killing whales to count how many there are. Um, it's, it's not something that's too nice to think about. Anyway, the point here is that um, we don't have to make a brain that looks precisely like my brain in order to have something that's conscious. So what we perhaps could do is to make some DNA. DNA is a very, very complex structure, as you know. There are billions of units joined together to make it. But the units that are used to make it, in fact, are very straightforward. They only use simple atoms, and we can play around with those simple atoms and make the components of DNA in the lab. So in principle, it would be possible for us to make DNA in the lab with instructions in that DNA that tell, um, that explain how to make a brain. So you'd imagine that perhaps what we need to do is to take DNA, we identify the regions on it which code for brain, and then we make a string of DNA that contains all of those regions. Um, and we get biology to build that brain because technology, as we saw a couple of slides ago, doesn't seem to be able to do the job for us. Um, there is a guy called Craig Venter in the US who has apparently in his Craig Venter Institute actually made a bacterium from scratch. He has made the DNA for a bacterium starting with the kind of chemicals that you would find in a lab. So in principle, doing this kind of thing is possible. In practice, it's not partly because the coding for brains is not in one nice, neat little area in DNA. It's spread all over it or spread in, in multiple places. So doing 
using biology to make um, an artificial brain is, is not going to work either. But there is one final possibility. Here we are, this is what we're trying to reproduce, and I've argued that it's not possible to do that in three dimensions using the kind of technology that we've got. Could we do it in two dimensions? This brain here contains, as I say, maybe 80 or 100 billion neurons. And by chance, the best uh, computer chips these days, the largest and most effective computer chips, contain about 50 to 80 billion transistors, which are the, the processing units within a, a, a chip. Now, the fact that these processing units are not joined in the kind of complex way that the neurons are joined in means that this doesn't really resemble a human brain at all. But these chips are comparatively small. And if we joined perhaps 100 of these together, then we may well be able to get something which can reproduce human thinking. And the key point here is not that we need to produce something which looks like a brain, which has the same structure as a brain. We need to produce something which generates the same kind of thinking. Doing a design on this is a major task, um, but this is the one conceivable way in which in the fairly, in the not too distant future, we might have machines which can think like humans and therefore perhaps will be conscious like humans. So four slides to come. Let me start with some conclusions. First of all, there is no going back. We can't undiscover AI. Uh, when science manages to um, think up something new, generally speaking, that becomes public knowledge. And when that something new is beneficial, um, we're not gonna be able to forget it. So we're not gonna be able to wipe out AI. And indeed, AI can be beneficial. This is a protein molecule. Proteins are, as you know, very numerous in the body. There are thousands of different kinds of proteins in the body. And when a protein is made in the body, it's made as, as though it was coming out of a sausage machine. So you get a sort of string of atoms that's formed and this string of atoms gradually grows and grows and grows. And as the string of atoms, gr atoms grows, it folds itself up. So you have a globular shape in the end usually. And this globular shape consists of perhaps a thousand, perhaps 10,000 atoms. Therapeutic drugs are usually designed so that they will interact with proteins. And the interaction occurs usually at a specific site in the protein, perhaps a little site like this, where a small molecule, a small drug molecule can settle. This is the active site. And for the interaction between a drug and a protein to be meaningful, the shape of the protein's active site and the shape of the drug have to match. If they don't match, it's unlikely that the drug will have any effect on the protein. Now, that means that knowing the shape of proteins is very important because we can easily determine the shape of a potential drug, but it's very difficult to determine the shape of the active site in the protein. So the, the shape of a protein is generally determined experimentally. It is difficult to determine experimentally. It's expensive to do. It's tedious to do. And many proteins don't form crystals, which makes determining that shape very difficult. This is called the protein folding problem. And this has been a problem for 50 years. And for most of those 50 years, people have not believed that it's going to be solved. But deep mind which is a London, UK based artificial intelligence uh, company has created this thing they've called AlphaFold and that has solved the protein folding problem. And this is, to be frank, is an astounding piece of work. It's a quite remarkable thing for them to do. You might look at this and think, well, who cares? You know, maybe a biochemist would be interested in this and perhaps a computer expert would be impressed, but it's much more important than that. Because if we can predict the shape of any protein, and that's what alpha, alpha fold is moving towards, then that is likely to reduce the time required to create drugs to affect that protein by a factor of three. So instead of it taking 10 or 12 years to create a new drug for a protein, it might take three or four years. And instead of taking more than a billion dollars 
to produce that protein. It might take a third of that. So this is just a remarkable demonstration of the power of AI. Um, and to my mind is by far the, the most powerful demonstration so far. Secondly, clear explanations are essential and governments are doing a very bad job at ensuring that we get explanations. In the European Union uh, in 2018, something called the General, Pro General Data Protection Regulation was put in place. This was designed to protect consumers and um, from the downside of AI. And one of the statements in it was this, information should be provided to consumers about the logic in an AI. And this is completely the wrong way of looking at things because the logic in an AI is the way that the code is arranged in the AI, the algorithms that are used in it, the way that it produces um, a recommendation or an answer. What we need instead is information should be provided about the reasoning of an AI, because the logic is going to be impossible to understand unless you're a computer expert. What we need is something that tells us about the reasoning, how an AI can justify its decision. In the UK, uh, the UK has a, a two house system just as Canada does. And in the UK, the House of Lords is roughly equivalent to the Senate in Canada. They issued, the House of Lords issued a report in 2019 that produced this awful, awful statement. If we only use what we understand, we reduce the benefits of AI enormously. Let's translate that. What it says is we've no idea what's happening in an AI, but that doesn't matter at all. And that's just a disastrous kind of statement. So as I say, this was produced in a report to the House of Lords. And what it should be saying is only by understanding AI can we limit any dangers. In the absence of X, our inanimate spirit, construction of a conscious machine may be feasible. If it is feasible, then it's likely to proceed through bolting together uh, a fairly large number of two dimensional um, computer chips but that is going to be difficult and it's, it's not just a matter of wiring them together. There's a lot of design that would need to be um, added to, to, to get that to work. So should we worry? Well, here is the final slide. Let me present you with two scenarios. The first one we can call benign. And this is when AI does a good job and therefore gets funding and therefore is developed and does a better job and is very widely used. After a while, we have AIs which can learn two or three things without forgetting. So our AI might learn about beer and it might learn about hockey, but it's unable to make any connections between them. It doesn't know what, if anything, might link law and hockey. Under those circumstances, really what we need is explanation because the AI is not threatening. Under the less benign scenario, AIs again uh, proliferate, they again develop, and again they are able to learn two or three or many different things. But now a way is found for them to be able to um, join the fields together. And so they begin to see the connections between lying on a sofa and drinking a beer and so on. And when that happens, their thinking will grow very rapidly and it will probably quite quickly reach a point at which its understanding and its thinking matches that of humans. This is such an important point that it has a name. It's called the AI singularity. So the AI singularity is when AI matches the quality of human thinking. And once that point is reached, AIs will be smart enough to start designing new AIs and soon AIs will be cleverer than humans and they will design yet cleverer machines. And this is the proverbial can of worms. Two difficulties would arise, well, many difficulties would arise, but let me give you two. The first would be if you got fed up with your AI that was so clever, and so you took the computer that it lived on and you threw it into recycling. You might think, well, that, that doesn't sound too bad, even though my, maybe my AI is conscious and can think more than I can. 
but compare it to your grandparents. You wouldn't take your grandparents who are conscious and thinking beings and throw them in the recycling. And yet you've done it with your computer, which may actually be at least intellectually at least superior to your grandparents. The second problem, of course, is that if we have now vast numbers of very intelligent machines and they're brighter than us, then this is an existential risk to humans. So let's look at these, the connection here. If we get to the stage um, where the AI can link all of these things, then we're really in trouble. So let me, before I pass you back to John, tell you what the connection is between these four images. Maybe you've already found it. <clears throat> in 1973, my wife and I came to Canada for the first time, and um, we discovered that in Canada, people play hockey, not on green fields, as all sensible people do, but on ice. And we further found that on the television, there was this program called Hockey Night in Canada. It turned out that all our friends, when Hockey Night in Canada came on the television, would grab themselves a beer and they would lie flat on the sofa in order to watch the television. And the fact that essentially everybody did this in Canada told us that there was probably a law that meant that you were required to do that. So that's the connection. And let me now pass you back to John. Well, thank you, Hugh. That was a most captivating presentation, uh, thought-provoking and uh, yet cautionary. Um, and we do have uh, a number of questions for you to, re to respond to. Uh, I'll just start off with the, uh, the, the first question submitted. What, what would you say is the very best use of AI uh, for humanity and what is the most ethically concerning use of AI in your view? I, I think so far the, the very best use is, is the one that I touched on towards the end um, from DeepMind. DeepMind up until about seven or eight years ago was almost a, a sort of um, a, a theoretical think tank. They gathered together a lot of very good people in AI and they just said, well, you know, let's go ahead and, and sort of play. Um, and they played very, very effectively. So the, the first thing that they produced that really sort of caught the imagination of, of people at large was AlphaGo. This was the AI system that learned to play the game Go, which um, if you've tried to play it, you'll know is a fiendishly difficult uh, game to play well. And AlphaGo fairly quickly managed to beat everybody including the world's best Go player. And I think that DeepMind was, was encouraged by this, so they, they've moved into, into other fields. They are, I think I'm correct in saying, they're now owned by Google. Uh, now that's both good and bad. Google, um, like Amazon, is sort of taking over the world. On the other hand, Google has lots of money and DeepMind is very well supported. So the AlphaFold um, AI that they've got that predicts the shape of proteins um, is it really it really is an astonishing piece of work. It, it's um, I remember when I was a student, which admittedly was a long time ago, um, but in those days people talked about protein folding and said this is um, this is a roadblock. You know, we we are never going to know the shape of many proteins, and there is no possible way to predict them. So what they've done with that is, is genuinely remarkable. In terms of um, bad applications, uh, what comes to mind is the use of face recognition technology um, in, in a widespread fashion. Um, face recognition technology is used, of course, in, in places like um, immigration, but critically, it's also used very extensively now in, in some major cities, especially in China, but not exclusively in China. Um, and, and so there is a big invasion of, of privacy there. Um, and it's the, the Chinese have got this down to a, a fine art now. 
um, they have a, a huge database and, and their, their system is extremely good, but it's also, I think, rather worrying. Mm -hmm. well, I was wondering then, uh, because it, like, it would seem to me like defense ministries and the military and security agencies would have a very keen interest in AI uh, and probably be heavy funders of, you know, products or programs that they'd, they'd want to use. I mean, I mean, I, you just think about, uh, you know, warfare and stuff like that. Is, is there, I imagine there's quite a lot of AI activity within that security military uh, complex. Would that be the case? Yes, yes, it is the case. Um, there's there's a story I, I don't know whether it's true it's it's one of these stories that has been repeated so many times you don't know whether it's true or not but it's it's rumored that in the early days of ai the um u.s military was interested because they thought that they could develop ai to detect tanks remotely so you would have a camera set somewhere out on the the battlefield um and the camera would just sort of look at the the environment and spot tanks and um, the military thought it would be a good idea to do this, and you could do it using AI, and, and you certainly can now. In order to do this, you have to train your AI, as, uh, as I gave the example of the cows. So training an AI to spot tanks, what you do is you show a tank out in the open, and you show a tank half hidden behind trees, and a tank coming over the hill, and all this kind of thing. And the so the, so the, the word goes the military managed to produce an AI and they trained it to spot tanks. And then after they trained it, they tested it by showing it some pictures of the environment where in some of which there was a tank and in some of which there was no tank. And they were astonished because they found that this AI worked virtually 100%. Um, and what they'd done was that they had, in order to create some training data, um, what they did was they took lots of pictures of tanks on a sunny day and in order to create some um, background data when there was no tank, it turned out they'd taken a lot of pictures on a rainy day. And so what the computer learned was that tanks are associated with sunshine. Um, and, and so it was spotting the weather, it wasn't spotting the tank. Now whether this is, is true or apocryphal I don't know, but it's, it's perfectly possible. Um, more recently, the military of, of many countries are interested in using remote vehicles. Um, a lot of the drones that one learns about that you see uh, and you hear about, a lot of the drones have AI built in, so they have image recognition built in. And um, the, there's, of course, lots of money in, in the military, so these, these are probably pretty good. But you, you don't tend to see reports in the, in the scientific journals that tell you exactly what the, the AI that they're using looks like. Yeah. Um, this is a, a submitted question. What, what is the biggest error in your view that you've seen in AI? Sorry, the biggest error? Biggest error, mistake. Um, I'm sure there's been some. Uh, that's, that's difficult to answer. I mean, the, the one thing that comes to my mind is um, not, not, a, not a particularly sexy example, and that is that um, it, my, my own field is in, is in physical chemistry, physical and computational chemistry. And when AI started getting into science, um, which was in the, the mid-90s, I suppose, um, there, were, there was all of a sudden a tremendous amount of interest from China because even in those days they were very good at computing and um, this seemed to be uh, sort of uh, an area that they could produce some, some really good work in. And what happened was that many researchers there used AI without actually understanding the limitations of it. Um, for example, if you, the, the, um, this artificial neural network thing, which is, tends to be at the middle of an AI, um, there are a number of, of parameters associated with this. And essentially what, what the AI is doing when it's being trained, when it's learning, is it's optimizing the values of these parameters. So you might have a hundred unknowns, if you like. 
and somehow the AI is working out the best values for these 100 unknowns. Now, in order for that to be successful, the number of examples that you have to show to it has to be very large. And what um, a lot of these researchers were doing was taking a very small number of examples and showing it, showing these, these examples to the AI and finding the AI was, was brilliant. But in fact, it was not brilliant at all. It was just sort of being um, confused by the fact that there were a very small number of samples there. So that was a sort of a kind of scientific misstep. It was a, a group of people who looked at AI and thought, oh, this, this sounds as though it's going to be a useful kind of thing. And were using without sort of fully understanding the complexities of it. Um, I, 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 I struggle to think of something that is a, a really gross error um, in the sense of a mistake. Um, I mean, I, I think it, 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 it's, it's an error that we are using face recognition as much as we already do, but that's um, that's a tactical error. That's a political mistake rather than, than one within the field of AI itself. Yeah. Well, kind of leaving the, like the facial recognition seems to be kind of ethically perilous. Uh, could a machine be taught human ethics or empathy? That's, that's a delightful question. Um, it's an area, there is, um, in, in, in Oxford, there is, I think it's an institute, or maybe it's just a bunch of people, but there is a, a group who are working on the ethics of AI. And that, I believe, is one of the things that they're looking at. Um, how you would do that, I, I don't know, because the, the, the AIs are only going to learn from examples. And so you need to provide examples of what you believe to be good ethics but of course if you know what those examples are then maybe there isn't a, a need for an AI. Um, I, I really don't know I, I think I mean there, there are some intriguing aspects of AI um, using an AI to pick stocks from the, the the stock market is a boring application protein folding is an exciting application and, and getting an AI to learn ethics is a, a, an intriguing thought. Yeah. I was just wondering, uh, you know, like these personal assistants or whatever they're called, like Alexa and Siri, uh, how, how, like say you're looking at AI like scale from uh, low level to high level, where, where would Alexa fit in? Uh, well, I mean, you probably need to ask companies like Google and, and so on where, um, where they fit in. Um, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, if, for example, you do a, uh, a Google search for something, the search is extremely rapid. And the reason that it's, or one of the reasons that it's extremely rapid is that the search is being analyzed as you type it in. So if you type in four or five words, by the time you have typed in the first character of the fifth word, it's already looked at the first four words and it's analyzing them. And it's trying to predict what it is that you're asking, even without having um, completed the, the query. Um, so AI is, is crucial. And if you have something like Alexa, then of course, if you haven't got it turned off, it's always potentially listening to you. Um, and every query is extra data. So if you feed in a query into Alexa or some system like that, and um, it says, well, here are some links that might be interested, interesting to you. It will then look to see which links you clicked on because that provides an indication as to how successful you judge that search. So all of this stuff is fed back into the systems. And, and um, again, this is something that, that goes on and, and the, um, the internet search companies don't try to hide it but equally they don't tell you very much about how it's done and how extensive their systems are. Well, I was wondering, because uh, you, you were saying like with AI, uh, it's difficult to explain the logic of uh, how it's, it's logic. 
uh, and to get an explanation out of it. Uh, could AI be used to basically work on that problem? Like get kind of a meta AI. Um, that's, that's an interesting idea. I mean, th there are various ways in which you can extract information from an AI. Um, usually what you want to do is to tackle it at the design stage. And instead of taking, as it were, a, a bold standard AI, which is only going to generate numbers and, and do it in a way that is very unpredictable, you can design an AI so that it is set up and is, is more in, it, it's more possible to interrogate it. it. Um, whether you could use an AI to, to do the analysis is, I'm sure people are looking at that, um, but I don't know what kind of progress would be made at this stage. Yeah, because I, I guess you need like example after example after example. You would do, you would do, yes. Yeah. Now you, you mentioned uh, about the singularity, yeah. AI singularity. Uh, like, is that a re reality? And like, how close it, would we be to it? Are we going to see it in our lifetime or our children's lifetime? It's, it's a very interesting question. Um, there are a variety of, um, a variety of opinions amongst computer scientists and philosophers and physicists, and you know, everybody wants to, to put their oar in. Some people argue that we will never get there. Um, that seems to me to be an unduly pessimistic or optimistic view, whichever you, uh, whichever you like, um, because it sort of presupposes that nobody can be cleverer than humans. No thing can be cleverer than humans. But that is, that seems to me to be unlikely. Uh, e evolution probably has not generated in John Anderson and Hugh Cartwright, the most clever people that there will ever, ever be. There will be more clever people and they may think in a different way. So I, I think that those people who regard the singularity as being a complete non-starter, um, I, I would disagree with that. Other people have argued that it may be 100 or 200 years away. Um, there are some quite notable people who've suggested that it might be here in perhaps 20 years. Now, they are suggesting that without knowing really how we're going to get there, because as I've suggested, um, making a machine that can think like us is technically very challenging. Could, in, could indeed be impossible, but I suspect it is possible, but it nevertheless is definitely challenging. But if you think how rapidly things have moved, then maybe 20 years is, is not unrealistic. I mean, I, I, when, when I took my first job before university, it was with a computer company and the computers in those days, I'm in my mid seventies, the computers in those days filled large rooms. Um, and AI was nowhere at all 20 years ago. And now you see it all over the place. So I think that this, we're continually caught off guard by the speed at which things change. So my guess would be that maybe there's a 50-50 a chance that you or I might possibly see the AI singularity. Um, but I think it's probably something that our children um, are going to have to deal with. And that's going to be an immensely difficult challenge. Yeah, I would think so. But uh, it seems that uh, what's going on now, as you've described, is uh, uh, maybe we'll look back as the golden years of AI and we're kind of getting the optimal use of it uh, these days with things like Alexa and so on and uh, Tesla cars once they stop, uh, you know, flaming out or running over people. And running over elephants. Yes. Well, they avoid elephants, apparently, according to, to recent reports. But anyway, uh, I'd like to thank you so much for this uh, uh, presentation, Hugh. It's, it's been captivating, as I mentioned, most interesting and uh, very comprehensible. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, and thank the audience uh, for attending. Thank you for your questions. And... Uh, I look forward to next year's Masterminds. Uh, this is the last presentation in Masterminds 2022. 
So thank you and good evening.